Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com and today I'm taking your questions on crew membership, engine vibrations, the new GTI, and more. This is episode 180 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, 180 episodes. How cool is that? If you want to get a question on a show like this, the best way to do that is to email me, charles at humblemechanic.com, right down here in the bottom. Put question for Charles in the subject, ask your question right at the top, hit the enter button, give me some space, then give me the details. That helps out so much when I'm trying to answer your question, because I know your question while I'm reading the details. Also, if you don't see your question on a show like this, be sure to check out the quick videos playlist on YouTube. That's where I generally answer one question per video, much shorter, much quicker, and typically with my iPhone. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. All right, so first up, we're gonna talk a little bit about premium membership, the crew membership program. This, if you're watching this video on the day that it comes out, which is gonna be Monday, it launches tomorrow, January 31, 2017. Remember, the first 100 founding members are going to get an extra special gift package from me, a couple of humble mechanic screwdrivers, uh, some stickers, and I'm going to give away a bunch of other stuff randomly. So be on the lookout if you're one of the first 100. You may get a little package like this, or you may get a box that's quite a bit bigger. But a lot of people have been asking me, Charles, what, what are you talking about? What is crew membership? What does this all mean? Premium, you're selling content. What the hell, man? So check it out. From day one of Humble Mechanic, I always knew I wanted to build a premium membership side of the site, right? So what I've done is I've been able to take all the training material that a colleague of mine and I, we write for training VW and Audi technicians. I've uploaded that so you can get downloads of that. You're gonna get discounts to about seven different vendors right now, and I'm working really hard to get you guys a couple more. I don't know if it's gonna happen by Tuesday, but just trust me that it's going to happen, and these discounts are going to be awesome. Initially, a lot of it's VW-centric, but as we move forward, I'm trying to expand out to the automotive world and beyond. I'm trying to get someone to give us a good deal on coffee is like the number one thing I'm working on now. Detailing stuff, so we got Eurowise, we got Black Force, we got MT Knives, we got a bunch of other ones. I'll put links down in the description. Of course, on the blog, there's always these links. Uh, I will link up the crew membership page when it's live, so you can just go right to the page and see all the really cool benefits. You're also going to get exclusive videos from me. So I already shot like two of them. They're really cool. A lot of announcement -y stuff on the GTI. But if you don't want to join the crew membership and you're wondering what the heck's gonna happen to this channel, well, from your end, not a whole lot. Actually, it's gonna get better, but not a whole lot's gonna be different. Still doing Q&A shows, still answering emails, still doing DIYs, showing the engine build on the GTI, still showing all the same stuff that I normally do. This is going to be in addition to what I already do. A lot more work for me, but it's gonna be a huge benefit for the folks that joined the crew membership program. And for the people that don't remember, this is a good thing for everybody. It's gonna make the channel better. It's gonna give me the opportunity to do a lot more things than I can do right now. So I'm really excited about it. Guys, if, it's, if you're watching this on the day it comes out, set an alert on your phone for tomorrow at two o'clock. I'll be shooting out an email, I'll be doing a video. There'll be no doubt that you'll all know that this is going to happen on January 31, 2017, and it, you'll be able to join at any time. That's just initial launch, so if you wanna be one of the first 100 and get some really cool swag, make sure you're ready to go 2 p.m. Eastern time on January 31. All right. Since that's all wrapped up, let's get into your questions. First one comes from Dennis. Having a problem locating the source of an engine vibration. Vibration has been getting worse over the past few months to the point that the dashboard now seems to have developed a rattle as well. The vibration is worse at idle and gets better at speed. So he's got a 2002 Jetta AZG engine code. It looks like it was built in Germany. So I'm guessing he's uh, somewhere rest of the world. It looks like Dennis has replaced a ton of stuff uh, including engine mounts, which was kind of what I was thinking at, uh, at the initial onset. He's done a lot of fuel system cleaners, crank sensors, engine mounts, car starts without an issue, replaced some other stuff, coil pack, spark plugs, and that. He wants to know what's next. Check for a vacuum leak, check compression, replace injectors, replace fuel pressure regulator, MAF, and he doesn't want to throw money at it. Well, I don't blame them because, you know, throwing money at a car is just frustrating, right? And expensive very, very quick. So, 
There's no way I can know exactly what Dennis's problem is, right? A lot of times with questions like this, all I can do is go through what my process would be if I got handed a repair order and said, Charles, this car has a vibration. This is what I would do. I would get in it and I would start it. And I would just sit there for 15, 20 seconds and get the feedback from the vehicle. Is it doing it now? Is the vibration happening when the car is sitting in park at a stop? Okay, because why else would you be in park, right? Um, I would then shift it into neutral. Does it change? I would shift it into drive, still with my foot on the brake, not going anywhere, and see in each of these gear positions how it changes. Because stress on the engine, stress on the motor, stress on the car is going to change based on what gear you're in, especially with an automatic transmission. Manual transmissions aren't going to be quite as sensitive because you're not loading it as you are when you put a, an automatic into drive. So I would first do that. Then I would drive it. I would experience the vibration for myself. What happens when I accelerate? What happens when I decelerate? What happens when I just coast, take my foot off the gas and just coast on? How does the vibration change? So we have to look at these things. I haven't really experienced this a lot in Jettas, but I've experienced this a lot in Passats. And what happens is that when you put it in drive, that's when the vibration starts. And it's actually the inner axle joints that are worn. So it's putting stress on the axle joints and it's causing the whole car to vibrate. It gets pretty intense. Drop it into neutral and that goes away. You've unloaded the engine and transmission, you've unloaded the axles, so the vibration goes away. That would be my very first step to see if it's the inner joints wearing out. Look at the boots if you can get underneath the car and make sure they're not broken or have come apart. But that's probably where I would focus first. Next, is this a vibration or is this a rattle? because these cars are good about rattling catalytic converters and oil pan covers. That'll create a very pronounced, very low tone rattle. Sometimes at idle, sometimes on acceleration, sometimes while sitting in park, sometimes if you just rev the engine, it'll do it too. So I would take a look at that next. I would also make sure that the installation of the engine mounts was okay. Make sure that it's not stressed one way or another. That can cause a vibration. Make sure that, you know, that the engine isn't twisted or twisted one way or another. And this is the one that is so far out there, it's probably what's going on. When did this all start? Did this start after a repair was made? Because I've had multiple cases where guys have dropped sockets and it rests right between the engine mount and the transmission. And boy, when you put it in reverse, it shakes the entire car. It's insane how much vibration and feedback you get from a little piece of metal wedged in the wrong spot. So if this started after you did a repair, say a battery or something like that, or a, an air filter, Go back and recheck that and make sure you didn't drop something down in the engine compartment because that could easily, easily cause it. Whenever we have these experiences, we always want to look is, when did this start? Did it start after a certain event? Maybe you curbed the car. Maybe you had some work done. Really focus on that because then you can go back to the area that was worked in, start there, and work your way out. All right, next one comes from Bob. I purchased a 2017 Passat with the 1.8 and have been following the discussion about carbon buildup on the backs of the intake valves. CRC has brought forth a cleaner which to be sprayed in the intake system downstream from the MAF sensor. They recommend treatment every 10,000 miles, which happens to be the recommended service interval. I intend to keep the car a while and plan to do oil change every 5K but would like to avoid expensive procedure down the road. Any thoughts? Thanks for your help. So what Bob is saying is CRC, which is a company that makes chemicals, makes treatments, has developed a product that you spray into the intake and it's supposed to clean the backs of the valves. This is a huge, huge, huge discussion, right? I've done a video on carbon buildup and what happens, so I'll post a link down in the video description if you wanna check that out. But basically what happens is junk gets built up on the backs of the valves. This causes reduced horsepower. This causes reduced fuel economy. This causes cold start misfires. That's the big one that most people notice right away. Generally decrease in power and decrease in fuel economy happen over time. Cold start misfires tend to just start to happen. So do I think this is a good idea? Well, honestly, Bob, I don't think it's a bad idea at all. You know, one of the things about carbon buildup is there's a point where we have to decide how much is it to fix versus maintain. There's other companies that have the whole treatment package and it's you know 200 bucks. Well, two or three of those, you've basically paid for a decarb, so it kind of comes out as a wash. But when you're talking a 10, $15 can of treatment, whether it's CRC, whether it's Seafoam, any of that stuff, these can be, because some products are really crap, 
These can be good, and here's the key, good preventative. These things will not fix carbon buildup once it starts to cause a problem in the car. These are going to be good, like Bob mentioned, for a 10,000 mile, 20,000 mile interval, 5,000 mile interval if you want to get you know, real, real particular about it. That's when these types of things shine, to prevent large amounts of buildup in the first place. If you're at 80K and we got another question right next to it, they came in right behind each other. If you got you know, at 80K and you got severe carbon buildup, stuff like this, especially one treatment, isn't going to take care of the problem. At that point, you have to pull the intake manifold and manually clean the back of the valves or use a media blaster and use walnuts or soda or whatever, but you have to mechanically clean it. You can't just clean it with one of these chemical treatments. But if you're doing it as preventative, I actually think this is a really good idea. So Bob, I would go ahead and do it. Follow the instructions to the letter. Don't go off the reservation and, and do your own thing. Follow the instructions to the letter. Do it every 10K and you probably will never have a problem. Bob is starting on a brand new car and that's gonna be key too. You wanna start this on a brand new car. You wanna start it on a car that just had a decarb because again, that won't break down the amount of carbon that gets built up and it does happen pretty quick. Luckily, the 1.8 turbos aren't as problematic as the two liters have been, the two liter TSIs have been, but there's always the potential for that to develop into a problem because a lot of these things don't develop at 20, 30,000 miles, they develop at 50, 60, 70,000 miles. So Bob, great question. If anyone else is doing this same regiment, like Bob's asking about, give them your experience, throw it down in the comments section, and again, Let's let them know what we're finding out there. All right, next one is from Josh. Is there anything extra I should do on a 60K service interval not indicated in the manual for a 2012 Beetle with a six-speed manual transmission? I bought the Beetle new in 2012 and I have almost 54K. I've never had any issues other than bad coil packs, probably due to the APR stage one. Tune, after watching videos on common failures, I've become a little paranoid about carbon buildup, intake manifolds, timing chain issues. Any suggestions would be great. So Josh, awesome questions. Uh, you're coming up on 60K. If, unlike what Bob was asking about, we haven't done anything about carbon buildup, odds are you're starting to develop it. So a fuel treatment in the tank might, it won't take care of it, but it might help a little bit. More to clean the injectors rather than the intake valves, and that becomes important as well. Um, other things at 60K that we do is going to be an air filter, a pollen filter, um, rotate and balance of the tires, oil change, wiper blades, you know, do all the inspections on your car, axles, brakes, tires, that kind of stuff. Very, very common, you know, normal any car type things you want to check. Your lights, your headlight aim is not a bad idea either. The things you brought up, intake manifolds, timing chain tensioners, carbon, those are the big things, right? Intake manifolds, you may or may not be covered under an extended warranty, so you might not even have to worry about that. Carbon buildup, it's too late to worry about doing anything to prevent it, maybe, but you know, if you get an intake manifold failure, it's a great time to piggyback a carbon a decarb on an engine. The big one though, the big one that can cause catastrophic damage is the timing chain tensioner. That 2012 to 2013 year is about when they changed to the newest style tensioner. But this depends on a couple of things. Production date of the car, but more importantly, when the engine was built, right? If it was a, a 2011 assembled engine in a 2012 car, regardless of when the production date of the car was, you might have the old tensioner. I did a video on exactly how to check this and what to look for. It's super easy. If you have a, a telescoping mirror, it makes it even easier. If you don't, it's a little bit more challenging. I'll link that video up, follow that video and check your tensioner. If it's the old style, it's not a bad idea to get it replaced. 60K is pretty low mileage to see failure. You're probably, maybe, depending on when you bought your car, still under powertrain warranty. So if it did fail while you're under powertrain, it's not a problem, Volkswagen will take care of it. But if it were me, I would be a little uneasy as well. So first I would get it checked or check it myself and then decide what to do from there. You can think of it as like a one-time timing belt replacement to get that chain tensioner fixed. And the good thing at this mileage, you're probably not gonna have to worry about chain stretch as much as you would if this had, call it 110,000 miles on it. The only other Beetle specific things that we've seen over the years is really been window regulators, which I'm sure since you've had it since 12, you've experienced the three or four or five different updates and campaigns that we had on the windows back then. So you probably already got that taken care of. Other than that, man, there's not a ton of stuff. We get quirky, weird things every once in a while. High pressure fuel pumps is another failure. 
that uh, is not super common as much anymore, but moderate. We still see them fail from time to time. Uh, so yeah, that's it, man. It's it's a pretty basic thing, a pretty easy car. A lot of the stuff that happens with the GTIs and the, the Jettas that have the 2.0-liter and the Tiguan and the Passat and the CC and all the other cars that have it, uh, it's common to the engine more than it's common to the body wrapped around it. So um, you can follow some of the other things that are going on with those cars. But if you haven't had a lot of these issues now, you probably won't. Great question, man. Good luck. And um, yeah, check that tensioner. And that's really the thing I'd probably be the most worried about. All right, one more. Last one comes from Matt. Enjoy your channel, even though I don't own a VW product currently. That's awesome, Matt. Thanks. I drive a 2002 Jeep Wrangler. It's fine for commuting short distances, but doesn't do well on the highways. With 307 gears and 31-inch tires, I'm not surprised. I like small cars, and I'm thinking of purchasing a 2017 GTI Sport with an automatic. Is the GTI going to hold up like a Mazda 3 would? I put less than 5K a year on my Jeep and would expect the same out of the GTI. Any help would be appreciated. Matt, this question is something I get a lot, right? More at the dealership, really, than, than in the internet world. Um, and this is a question that I hate to answer because I don't like the answer that I give. The answer is probably not, okay? I love the GTI. I think the Mark 7 GTI is a phenomenal car, but the GTI and most other Volkswagens are meant to be driven. The cars that we see with the most problems are typically the ones that are either short commute cars or very low mileage for the year cars. You know, it used to be this 10 year old car only has 50,000 miles, this is a great thing. Well, in the Volkswagen world, it's just not quite that way. They get really fussy when they're not driven. You know, the cars that are driven, driven hard, driven more spirited, as we'll call it, tend to have less problems. That's not a blanket statement across the board. That's just what I've seen over the years. So while I would love to tell you, Matt, the GTI is gonna be perfect for you. You're never gonna have any problems. It's gonna be a great 5K a year car. My gut says that it might not be. Now, there's probably plenty of them out there that only get 5K a year and are absolutely fine. But by and large, the cars that perform better and have less problems, from my experience, are the ones that get driven and driven and driven and driven. So is it gonna hold up like a Mazda 3? I don't know. You know, we can't, we can't just flat make that comparison. We have to compare individual car to individual car. But is it going to hold up like a Honda Civic would? Probably not. You know, look, look at the overall cost of ownership, look at the, you know, uh, problems per repair or problems per thousand of repair that JD Power puts out, which I don't buy all into that stuff, but it is an okay barometer of what's going on. And while I love, 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 love that GTI, I just worry if I tell you, yeah, dude, it'll be no problem. You're going to get the one that's going to have 5K on it. It's going to be nothing but problems. And I don't want to do that to you. So think long, think hard about that purchase. It's not a cheap car to buy and uh, you're only putting 5K a year on it. If it were me making this decision, I would make a different decision, but I'm also a different person. You know, that's why I have a $2,000 GTI instead of a brand new one. So man, I, I, like I said, I hate answering that question because I really want to say the GTI is the best choice for you, but I just, in my heart, sadly, sadly, don't think that's the case. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions, comments, you know what to do. If you like this video, throw the thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Don't forget to ding the bell or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. Remember with YouTube's funkiness of alerts, it's actually going to be better for you to sign up for email alerts on the blog than it will be on YouTube because you know you'll get the email from me. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, Snapchat. Also good places to get updates of new videos. Don't forget the crew membership coming on Tuesday, the 31st of January, 2017. That's gonna be awesome, it's huge, I'm so excited. I can't wait to give out, I have a box of these that I've just been dying to give away, plus all the other cool stuff that comes along with it. That's actually way more valuable than a simple pocket screwdriver, uh, but uh, I just, I love these screwdrivers. So. Don't forget, check that out if you're interested. If you're not, no hard feelings. It's cool, I get it. All right guys, thanks so much for watching and I will see you next time.